Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Rafael Sertoli is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on episode 103 of Boundless Body Radio, titled Health, Met- Health Metrics That Actually Matter. Rafael Sertoli is not afraid to learn, experiment, and forge his own way. Rafael has used low-carbohydrate diets for many years to deal with his own health issues, including allergies, asthma, poor digestion, brain fog, low energy levels, and joint pain. In 2017, he co-founded Nutrita, a startup selling a food tracking app available on iOS, Android, and as a web app. He has written science articles for the paleodiet.com and the U.S.-based nonprofit called the Nutrition Coalition, founded by our former three-time podcast guest, Nina Teichels, who we absolutely adore. Raphael was also the host of the Break Nutrition Podcast, which delivered high-quality episodes for many, many years. From 2018 to 2021, Raphael also worked in a private research lab called the Behavioral and Molecular Lab, located at the University of Minho in Portugal, where he studied neuroscience and metabolism. He is currently the head of scientific research at Clinica Pero, a medical clinic based in Lisbon, Portugal. Raphael Sertoli, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Thanks, Casey. That's a lovely introduction. Well, you do a lot of lovely work, so you definitely <laughs> earned that. We mentioned Portugal a few times in the introduction, but you are actually back home in France. Yeah, I'm back in my hometown of Nice. I'm, I'm living there with my, my wife and my uh, nearly nine-month-old uh, little boy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm back there. I'm working for this uh, medical clinic in Lisbon, Portugal, and I'm actually also working for a company called Zero Acre Farms. That's a startup based in uh, California who's producing a low linoleic acid oil uh, as an alternative to the uh, high linoleic acid, high omega-6 uh, seed oils that are plaguing a lot of the foods that we're eating nowadays. Yeah, that's amazing. This is why we had to bring you back. You've been busy in the two years since we have chatted yeah. <laughs> last time. Um, how is it to be a father? Congratulations on that, by the way. It's everything I hoped it would be and more. Um, it's it's hard to be away from the family. At the moment, I'm at the ISFAL conference in northern France, where it's the International uh, Society for the Study of Lipids and Fats. And so it's a really really interesting geeky conference uh but i'm away from the family for for five days so that part is not as uh, not as nice <laughs> is the kid running around yet not yet he can he can sit up and he can crawl uh but he's not yet uh walking uh that's amazing and mom, mom is yeah. doing okay as well yeah yeah she's great she's amazing that's that's fantastic well we have a busy episode planned we've got lots to talk about you are a very busy person but let's start out by reminding our audience your story and your interest in health which I think is amazing. When I was reading some of these things in your introduction, the the health issues that you had to deal with, allergies, asthma, poor digestion, brain fog, low energy levels, joint pain. Like, it sounds like I'm describing a 55-year-old. You know what I mean? Like, you were very, very young when you were experiencing these things. So can you tell us about your journey through health? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because when when these things are, are listed out, I actually realize how poor my health was. I didn't actually... Um, it wasn't, it wasn't a thing for me when I was growing up that I felt unhealthy or it was a huge issue. Um, but I did, I was basically born with, with asthma. Um, and this was really hard on my parents who didn't know what was going on, why I had these breathing issues. Uh, of course they gave me antibiotics straight away. Uh, they thought it was, uh, you know, bronchitis and other things, but it turned out to be an autoimmune condition called, called asthma. And then when I was around, you know, a bit old, like, around 10 going on 15 I had a lot of allergies to a a lot of different things pollen um, dust mites and I just always I I remember being a teenager with a red stuffy nose all the time just you know this this actually I do remember as something that sort of was really annoying especially when you're a teenager and you know you're very preoccupied about how you look and how you come across to girls and this was something that was really annoying. And that was one of the things that totally disappeared uh, with diet. Uh, so that was a big, uh, big improvement for me. Um, and yes, I do think that it affected my mood. I do think it affected my energy levels. Um, it affected quite a lot of things. And sometimes you don't realize how much um, your diet and other lifestyle factors can make you feel poorly, but we, we get used to it. You know, it's, it's also a defensive mechanism, right? We don't want to be we don't feel too bad when things aren't going well, but once you can achieve a better state of health, you sort of look back on it and realize, wow, I really wasn't anywhere close to what I what I what I can be, how healthy I can be. 
And, you know, diet has been the biggest change in, in my life, but there's a lot of other things I do. I really pay attention to my sleep. I pay attention to what stresses me out. Um, I'm very active. I always try to get a lot of sunshine, fresh air. So there's a whole host of things that, that I do. Um, but diet really was the, the, the biggest one for me, especially reducing carbohydrates and, you know, removing the, the uh, really bad seed oils. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And I agree with you. Um, I work with people on all kinds of things like that, all kinds of lifestyle factors. And I, I think people have different kind of levers that really make the biggest difference in the beginning. But certainly in my experience, it has been mostly that nutrition is the biggest one that if we can get that one right, it seems like more and more people are able to get some of the other things right. And those other things kind of come along um, down the path when when somebody's ready and because they're feeling good, right? Like you start eating good, like you said, right. and you start feeling so much better. It's easier to want to get wins in other categories. Um, you were very active growing up as well. I believe you said you were a soccer player and some of these things must have really impacted playing soccer for you. Yeah, I was, I loved soccer until I was probably 14, 15 years old. I wanted to be a professional soccer player, but I actually had to stop playing uh, soccer at a crucial point because I had this uh, this condition that affects uh, quite a few teenagers, actually. It's it's not something a lot of people have heard about, but it's called Schlatters. It's a difficult German name to pronounce. And it has to do with the cartilage and bones in the uh, heel of the foot that don't form properly. So it's just painful to walk around and you certainly don't want to be running on a pitch when you have that. So it, it basically took me out of the soccer game for a, maybe a year or two. And this is the crucial age where you have to demonstrate your skill and start, you know, being interesting to, to bigger clubs. So that point, uh, my, my, my dream was, was shattered. Um, but thankfully, I went on to do something that uh, I'm even more passionate about, uh, which is, you know, health and science. Do you think if you didn't have that year or two gap that you would have been able to get onto the national team and make a difference against Argentina in the World Cup last year? <laughs> well, one can always dream. Uh, statistically, no. <laughs> I would certainly not bet on myself. But I think I could have uh, achieved a reasonable professional level. Um, but, uh, I mean, you know, after that, who, who, who knows? I don't, probably could have made a small living for a couple of years, but I don't think I would have, you know, been one of those guys who can retire when they're 25 and made so much money. <laughs> yeah, sure. Gotcha. Okay, so you mentioned low carbohydrate. How was it that you were able to find low carbohydrate diets? Who introduced you to that? It was Gary Taubes, um, like, like had been the case for so many people. I read his book when I was at university. Uh, at the time, I was studying uh, Italian and management studies, so a language and a business course, and I was not interested in either of the things that I was doing, so I was looking for other stuff to read, and I was reading a lot of physics, history of science, and I don't remember exactly how, but I came across Gary Taubes' book. The first time I read it, I put it down after a couple pages because it was dense and I didn't really get it. And for whatever reason, I picked it up a couple months later and then I just couldn't put it down again. And he was going through the, this whole history of how we came to believe what we believe nowadays with regards to diet. And this sort of, this sort of historical perspective, I think is sorely lacking uh, in, in a lot of modern scientific discussions, a lot of scientific minds. And people aren't aware of why they believe what they believe. And I think that's such a valuable thing to be able to learn. And this is why I appreciate Gary Tapp so much. He brought this historical scientific perspective and he allowed me to gain perspective on the field that I was about to embark on. And if it wasn't for his book, I wouldn't have the career I have today. I wouldn't have the interests I have today. I wouldn't even have many of the friends I have today that I made you know, by going into this field and, 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 and meeting all these people. So he was really the, the trigger for me. Um, and the, his main recommendation was to lower carbohydrates. So I think, I think I, the first thing I did was cut out bread. Um, I wasn't a huge, uh, I, I didn't consume sodas really. Um, maybe, well, maybe some orange juice. So I guess that's pretty much the same thing. But I cut out basically bread, pasta, uh, croissants, all that stuff. Uh, that made a huge difference. And of course, I was... I also happened to cut out the fried foods, which contained bad oils. I just didn't know that that's what I was doing back then. Um, and, and that was a, a, the, the biggest step for me. I think it just, it, it allowed me to, I was never, you know, overweight. No one would have looked at me and said, you're overweight. But I was certainly carrying a very small love handles and I was skinny. I had, I had no, no muscle on me uh, back then. So it sort of 
highlighted that, yeah, you're, you're not overweight, but you're also not in very good shape. And then my interest in exercise uh, grew out of that, I think out of some vanity and out of the fact that I was always very active as a kid. I was, you know, um, cliff diving, hiking, bicycling, uh, doing all those things. And I had sort of stopped when I went to university. And once diet got me back into shape, like we were saying before we, we started recording, then this other stuff, this willingness to exercise, this extra energy uh, that I was given um, basically launched me into uh, gymnastics, weightlifting, CrossFit, uh, hiking, running, all that stuff. So now I do a lot of trail running. I do CrossFit maybe three to five times a week, uh, which is a mix of many different things, you know, hiking whenever I can. I'm very active and I couldn't imagine not doing that. It's just, I, I, I have this uh, uh, impulse to exercise and it's uh, something I wish more, more people had because I, I don't feel like I'm disciplined. A lot of people would say that, oh, you're so disciplined. You do this every day, you work out hard, but it's really something I just, I, I naturally want to do. Um, it's very interesting to me that that's kind of how it works. <laughs> I think people who go to the gym they're not healthy because they go to the gym, they're healthy, and thus they go to the gym. That's my yeah. view of it. I couldn't agree more. I think that's wonderful. What a cool feeling to actually get you know rid of some of these health issues that you were suffering from. And I think you're right. I think a lot of people don't know how good they could feel. It, it really is self-correcting. It'll make you want to stay on the diet because you just feel so good. So you described tons of different activities. You're very busy, um, lots of physical activity. What does your diet look like today? Do you follow any certain kind of like mm -hmm. particular diet or, or what things are you eating today? Yeah. So my diet is pretty simple. It's you know, mostly carnivore with dairy. And the reason why is because, so after I made these changes to my diet, which was just lowering the carbohydrate intake, and I would eat uh, meat, eggs, fish, lots of vegetables, fruit, nuts, basically a, what you would call a paleo diet, and that most people would think is very healthy. Um, cooking with olive oil, butter, all that stuff. But at some point around maybe when I was 25 years old, I just could not digest uh, leafy greens, anything that was fiber. So nuts, leafy greens, uh, even some fruit, basically would go out the way it came in. So ulcerative colitis is when your uh, colon is inflamed and you can't digest fibrous matter. It basically doesn't stay there to ferment, be, to be transformed into short chain fatty acids and, and get absorbed. That wasn't happening for me. I have no idea why. It's a bit of a mystery, but it tends to happen in males and it tends to happen around their mid-20s, which is what happened to me. Uh, I never got an official diagnosis because the gastroenterologists I saw were pretty useless, if I'm being honest. So I had to sort of figure it out myself. And I came to this diagnosis, which I also confirmed with uh, <clears throat> biopsies. So I, I asked for an endoscopy and a colonoscopy. Uh, to try to actually have some empirical evidence of what was going on in my digestive system. And, you know, coupled to the symptoms and those biopsies, I figured out, okay, you probably have ulcerative colitis. Um, there, there are different sort of subtleties to what it could be, but that's basically it. It's another immune autoimmune condition. And if you already have one autoimmune condition, you're more likely to develop a second one. So in my case, I had asthma. And then I developed this digestive uh, condition, which is considered autoimmune. So that also sort of makes sense. Um, so I triangulated this diagnosis. And then it was very simple. I figured out, well, I'm not going to eat something that I can't digest that makes me feel also bloated. Um, and so I just started cutting out plants. Um, I actually love vegetables. I still love vegetables. I like the taste. I love cooking them. Um, I really do in, enjoy it, but uh, they don't like me. <laughs> the, the plants don't like me that much. So, um, but I'm fine. I don't, I actually don't feel very restricted if I'm being honest. Um, people think it's a nightmare to have to eat like that. But I mean, 99% of the time when I go out for to a restaurant or to a supermarket, at least where I live in, in France and when I'm in Portugal as well, traveling for work, I always find something that's totally fine. You know, I'll just ignore the greens on the side of the plate, have the steak or the fish or the eggs, and I'm good. I don't feel um, like I'm deprived. I'll have little pieces of fruit here and there that are, uh, you know, not too rich in fiber. And I'll have honey as well. Honey, of course, is just 
basically sugar. So that is fine for me uh, in, in the amounts that I eat it. So I have dairy now, um, some honey. I also have uh, some chocolate. Um, because it's mostly fat, even though it has fiber, so I can I'm I can do uh, chocolate fine, and yeah, it's basically lots of steaks, uh, some fish, some salmon, you know, some mackerel, uh, uh, not some shellfish because I have <laughs> I have an um, I'm supposed to still have an anaphylactic IgE type allergy, so this sort of allergy where your throat closes up if you have shellfish. So I developed that when I was maybe twelve. Um, and I say maybe because I've been very good. I've managed to avoid shellfish my whole life, except this one time in my late 20s where I ate some, some seafood at a restaurant by mistake. And I thought, oh, my God, oh, my God, I have to go to the hospital. I'm, you know, I'm going to die. My friend drives me there uh, in a rush. Uh, I know I'm expecting any moment now my throat is going to close, you know, and nothing happened. So, so my, my, the question I asked myself was like, okay, you're supposed to have gone into shock basically, but nothing happened. So are you still allergic? The only way you can find out, you can't do the skin prick test or the blood test. You just have to eat the food and see if you react. And you need to do that in a hospital setting. So I've still yet to set up my dinner date with the, uh, with the doctor at the hospital and, <laughs> and, and have some, uh, some shrimp and see if I, if I make it basically. So that's, that's on my to-do list uh, this year. Wow, that's amazing. Well, you hear lots of people um, and their stories on this way of eating. Like I remember doing that same test a few years ago and I found out that my two class three allergies that I needed to eliminate were egg yolks and egg, egg whites. And I was eating a mixed diet mm -hmm. at the time. I eat a carnivorous diet now, um, but I was eating a mixed diet. I cut them out, I reintroduced them and they didn't seem to cause a problem, but now I can eat 10 to 20 eggs in a day. And I feel fine. Like I feel optimal on that. And you hear right. stories like that all the time. The people using a carnivore diet for, you know, weight control purposes, find that their health improves in so many different ways. And all those autoimmune conditions, like you described, your body attacking itself mm -hmm. for some reason, weird things start to happen there. And maybe foods that they weren't able to tolerate before are able to be tolerated afterwards. It's an interesting thought. I would bet that, that you would be right to go and test that. And I would, I would put my money on nothing happening, but it would be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll let you know when I do it, I'll, I should probably record it or something because it's pretty interesting thing to do to see if you're <laughs> to eat knowing that your throat could close up, but you're gonna, you're gonna take the chance. Um, but I have to say I didn't, you know, I didn't always uh, think this way in the sense that I, I've actually, I have some old Twitter messages where I'm uh, DMing with someone. And, and I, I, I could, you know, I can read myself saying, Oh, you know, people who criticize low carb don't realize that it, it can still include lots of vegetables and vegetables are really important and we need them. So I was totally bought into this idea that vegetables were the base of the diet. When I started my low carb diet, I would cook this huge meal with like six, seven different vegetables, you know, tons of spices, um, you know, very colorful, uh, huge volumes of, of vegetables basically and I, I enjoyed it but i was also bloated but i didn't know that was normal i thought okay you're you're full after a big meal that's that's what i had conditioned myself to expect and i also thought that they were uh full of micronutrients that you could just simply not get in animal foods and that they were essential and i just had to learn that this was not uh correct and that, in fact, I also had an interest in eliminating them from my particular situation. And what's funny is when I tell people how I eat, they automatically assume that's how I think everybody should eat. And it couldn't be further from the truth. But it's just an interesting psychological quirk we have when someone describes what they're doing. The assumption is, well, they must believe everyone else must do that. And this is simply not the case. Um, um, if, you, if you're asking what's optimal, I could have one opinion one way or another. But I certainly wouldn't say that, you know, you'd ha you have to be on a carnivore diet if you're, you know, following my, my lead, basically. I think there's yeah. quite, a, quite a lot of variation that people can, can enjoy. Yeah, I totally agree. Just because you and I are doing something doesn't mean we're yelling at vegans for doing something completely different. Like, that's not important to us. We're just here to help whoever wants to join us. So I'll ask you this question that I got in a carnivore consultation just uh, just yesterday, actually. How am I going to meet my, my human needs for fiber? How would you answer that question? Right. I would, I would tell them that the first thing to know when you're trying to figure out how you should eat is you should figure out how humans ate for hundreds of thousands of years. And I call this the evolutionary lens. So 
um, figuratively, you, you put those glasses on and you need to think through the evolutionary lens, meaning I need to make sense of what I'm doing today according to what I what my ancestors have done for hundreds of thousands of years. I think this is where most of nutrition goes wrong because it's such a complex topic. You simply cannot figure out everything from first principles. We don't have this ability yet. So I think you need to use this evolutionary perspective as a base. Once you do that, you can figure out that actually we're hyper carnivores. Now, people are shocked by that. Um, hyper carnivore is a technical term, and it means that we obtained 70% or more of our calories from animal foods. If you look at our digestive anatomy, we do not extract a lot of energy from fiber, from fermenting fiber. Uh, lots of animals do. Um, we're not one of them. We consume, or we consumed, I should say, highly energy dense and uh, nutrient dense foods, which mainly means that animals are concentrating plants. So animals consume plants, they concentrate that energy and those micronutrients, and they result in food for us, the apex predators, that are very cal calorically dense and micronutrient dense foods. So essentially, knowing that we're hyper carnivores, knowing that our digestive anatomy is optimized for these sort of foods, um, we can quickly figure out that actually we don't have an essential need for fiber. You can also test this out on yourself. You can eliminate fiber and see that you are still very healthy. Um, so I think that's a, a good sign because there's a lot of things that I could tell you to eliminate and you would immediately see some problems. And not everything, you're not going to see everything right away. But I think it's something you can self-experiment with and see, actually, I'm fine. My digestion is still good. Um, I'm not, you know, falling apart. My nails aren't coming off. My hair isn't falling out. I, I'm not, you know, I, I'm measuring stuff in my blood. I'm not seeing anything bad happening. You can confirm that by lowering the fiber in your diet. Um, of course, when you lower fiber, you're changing lots of other things in the diet. So it's not a perfect experiment by no means, but it's something that people can experiment with if they have doubts and confirm it with themselves that they're not going to fall apart. The digestion is not going to going to become terrible. In fact, it might even improve as it has for so many people who've tried it. Yeah, that's such a good point. I love that. And it reminds me of the work that you've done with our mutual friend, Dr. Mickey Bendor, and, and all the work that he's done looking at our paleolithic evolution and highlighting all of those things that yes, we, we are omnivores, but we do specialize and we have to lean our diets more towards a carnivore diet. That kind of leads us maybe to the next topic, which would be about tracking. Tracking our foods has been an interest of yours for a long time and trying to create scales and, and numbers of, and trying to like capture the quality of a certain food so that we can make easy recommendations for people that they can understand as far as knowing how to consume their food. What, what are some of the benefits of having trackers and scores and scales and things like that? And what are some of the drawbacks? So one of the benefits is that you learn, you tend to learn something. Um, you might not necessarily anticipate what you're going to learn, um, but you do tend to learn some interesting things when you pay attention because tracking is just uh, paying attention in, 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 in a way that's sort of objective and that you're not fooling yourself because um, we're very bad at recalling what we've eaten. Uh, we tend to exaggerate. In fact, it's quite interesting. People who are obese tend to have worse food recall than people who are lean probably because you know, their appetite is dysregulated. So it's, it's harder to, to keep track of what they're eating. Um, now, that being said, yes, it is educational. Yes, you can find, uh, figure out some hints of what's, what you're actually doing. You can get an objective picture, which is great. Um, it can be really good, but it has huge drawbacks and it's also not the goal. It's not what we want people to be doing for the rest of their lives. So I think I see it as a tool. And the reason why I think it's it's worth doing is because the way we're we're currently tracking food is basically we're tracking calorie intake, maybe grams of fiber. Um, we're trying to limit our saturated fat intake if we listen to government guidelines. We're making sure we're eating quote a balanced diet, whatever that means. For some people, that could mean you need a certain amount of carbs, fat, and protein. Um, so th there's a lot of confusion in what we should be tracking. And that's where the, the pitfalls, you know, uh, are basically. If we know what we need to track, then it can be useful. If we're tracking the wrong stuff, then that can be worse than not tracking at all. And that's where I think the scales we use are really, really important. So when I, when I launched uh, my first, my first uh, business venture, 
which now doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was Nutrita. And the goal of Nutrita was to help people track aspects of their diet that were going to help them, unlike calorie tracking, which is not a good strategy for long-term sustainable fat loss. Um, Nutrita basically gave people an insulin index. So that means that it was helping them identify the foods that would raise their insulin, which is a fat storing hormone, hormone and, and a key metabolic regulator. And the idea was that people are eating insulinogenic foods and we wanted them to choose foods that were gonna stimulate their insulin less. So on the surface of it, that's fine, but it gets very, very, very complicated because there are foods which will raise your insulin acutely like uh, protein, uh, which is not harmful because it's also raising other hormones like glucagon, you know, GL GLP-1 and other things that modulate this insulin response. And it's not going to uh, lead you into hyperinsulinemia because you're eating lots of steak. No one gets you know, uh, too much insulin from steak, yet acutely you do see a rise in insulin. So uh, even though I, we chose to use the insulin index, we knew that it was limited, but we thought it was an improvement on what was offered, which is basically calorie intake. So we wanted to improve it. Uh, we also devised a, a nutrient density score. And this was uh, really was my personal favorite because it was a way to cut through a lot of the myths about plants being the most nourishing foods uh, that we can choose. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Uh, plants are not the most nourishing uh, foods we can choose. Uh, that is animal source foods, at least for, for humans. And it was my way of getting people to eat more animal foods and obtain more micronutrients that were gonna make them healthy. And of course, combined with the insulin index, it was going to help them, you know, reduce their carbohydrate intake and basically lower the, the amount of insulin they produce. So both scores were meant to work together to help people eat more animal foods, lower their carbs, and that was supposed to help them, you know, achieve uh, better health. Now, unfortunately, it's a business venture. It was my first business venture and it didn't work out. We tried, we got an app out there, but it wasn't that successful. Um, there's a lot of things that we could have done better. Uh, you know, you're young, inexperienced, uh, the team is, is not in the same office together, we're each in different countries, it didn't work out. But it really taught me a lot about food scores, because it made me pay attention uh, to the limitations. Um, and this is why I've been so vocal about <clears throat> the satiety per calorie score that we've seen, um, you know, become really popular uh, recently over this last year. Um, and so I think in principle, it's clear that I have nothing against food scores. I think we should keep trying to develop them. We need to make things numerical for people so that they can you know, assess and compare and um, replicate different self-experiments they're doing. But I think we have to be very humble in how much we don't know and how much those food scores can mislead people. And you know, having tried to create one myself, I, I know how easily you can be misled by them and how you need to narrow their scope. I think this may be the most important thing. If you're going to develop a food score, try not to make it, you know, give you the uh, instructions on everything you should be doing in your diet. You should have it uh, narrow with a narrow scope so that you don't, you know, over promise, but rather under promise and over deliver. That would be a, a good food score. Well, just as a side note, I have to say that you even attempting a business startup is a success, regardless of whether it's still around or not. I think it's always a success to follow your passions and try something that nobody else is doing. So I do think that's successful. And now we are getting over to Diet Doctor. And before we kind of get into this, I just have to say, I love Diet Doctor. I love Diet Doctor. This was one of the websites I found very early in my low carbohydrate journey. It is the most wonderful resource for finding recipes, finding meal plans, finding education, the videos, um, movies that you could buy. You could create your own meal plans. There was a whole back page index that would send you to other websites. They were doing awesome work. It was such a cool thing. And I just have to say, like, as the gym that we were working at, they were doing weight loss contests that we had to do every three months. It was a two month contest. We'd have to fill, we'd have to give people the information that the gym would give them about proper nutrition and all the recipes and whole grains and fruits and vegetables and all this other stuff. And when we found low carb, we found a whole different system that we could bypass whatever the gym was doing and just do our own thing. And we started using diet doctor meal plans. And all I would do with the cohort of the people that we would have is I would just say, here are these meal plans, find recipes that you love, eat as much of these as you like, and, and let's see how you do in 60 days. 
we had much better compliance percentage than the gym's average. The gym average compliance for that contest somewhere around 15%. Our compliance percentage was up around um, about about 67%. And the numbers that wow. we had, we had, we ended up testing this on a body fat scale for a total of 126 people. The weight that was lost between those 126 people in 60 days was 735 pounds. And the percentage of that weight that came from fat was 720.9 pounds. We were getting to people to lose nearly 100% of their weight wow. from fat simply by giving them diet doctor meal plans and teaching them in a few seminars, like a few cool things about, you know, low carbohydrate. The people to run Diet Doctor, Andres Einfeld is, is the big one. I've met him at Low Carb Denver. He is as kind as he is tall. The dude is very, very tall. One of the kindest humans ever. So this is no knock on them or anything that they're doing. When when you found out that they were doing some type of food scoring system, what was your first reaction? Well, the the food scoring system, as far as I understand it, was the brainchild of uh, people outside of Diet Doctor initially. Um, I think it was a... Now I'm trying to get my my history right here. I think it was Brian Sanders who originally came up with the satiety per calorie score, and I think uh, Ted had the protein to energy ratio. Um, and somehow this this protein to energy ratio got like transmogrified into satiety per calorie. It's sort of the like a version 2.0 of the protein to energy ratio, and. This, I think, really appealed to and Andreas Einfeld because he uh, experimented with a higher protein version of low carb and lost, you know, a, a little bit of extra weight that he has. He's certainly not someone who's overweight, but he probably leaned out just by reducing some of the fat and increasing the protein, which is actually not surprising at all in lean people. I mean, I can see it in myself. If I lower my fat intake, increase my lean protein intake, I'm certainly going to, you know, lean out. You're going to see my, my abs even more. Um, now, I might not want to do that because I might, you know, not have enough energy to do CrossFit and to work and to be a dad and do all the things I want to do. But it's true. I certainly can lose uh, a bit of body fat doing this. So I'm, I'm not surprised at all by that result. But in people who are overweight, it doesn't always work like that. It does for a considerable number of people. In fact, um, even today, I, I do tend to recommend people who stole on their fat loss journey. I will tell them that you can certainly experiment dropping the fat and increasing the protein. Um, I don't see a problem with that. Uh, I think that's perfectly reasonable. Lots of people have found success with that. That's great, but that's not everyone. And there's a considerable amount of people who have tried this and who have failed. Um, and I think that, it's not fair to them to um, sort of push them out of the conversation, um, out of the belief that, well, you know, if it hasn't worked, they, they, they're probably cheating. You know, they're, 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 they're just eating fat. They don't realize they're just eating too much. And I think when we do that, um, we're, we're committing the same mistake from the sort of mainstream health advice that low carb was a response to. So that's where my personal disappointment and this approach comes not because the approach is advocating for more protein, less fat. That's totally fine. That's a great option. It's that this approach excludes the other option, which is some people can um, overcome their fat loss goal by increasing the relative percentage of fat and doing this at the expense of protein. That is a fact. People have done this. It has worked for them. I know quite a few of them personally. I've seen them in real life. I've spoken with them many, many times. And I've also witnessed it myself with uh, an, an ex that I had a few years ago. I was sitting next to her six months in a row, uh, once when she tried the high protein version first, because that's what I had actually recommended first to her. It didn't work. Then I recommended a higher fat version, still didn't work. Still wasn't losing the, the fat. So I've seen both modalities fail. And once you've you know, seeing the people eating the meals with them, you know, they're not cheating. What do you have to, you just have to accept the reality that's in front of you and be like, okay, there's something we don't understand here. It's not simply about restricting fat. You know, we, we knew very well that fat doesn't simply make you fat. That was, you know, the whole premise of the low carb movement. Um, but I think there's a big contingent in that movement who've been, who sort of forgotten this basic message and have sort of 
I think, floated back into this comfort zone of saying, well, you know, it does come down to energy balance. You should just eat less fat. You know, you, you, you can't just magically have, you know, more energy dense foods and not gain weight. Um, and I think when they say this, they're just forgetting all of the counter examples. We have lots of people who can, you know, be on a ketogenic diet, which is extremely energy dense by definition, because fat is the principal macronutrient in a ketogenic diet. And they can achieve a lot of success. So if, you're, if they've achieved success initially and they've stalled, it's not necessarily because they're still eating too much fat. There, there are a whole host of reasons that could be the case. You know, some people start taking glucocorticoids, right? And they start storing more fat. Some people get a gut infection. Something changes in their uh, microbiota, their inflammatory profile, and they gain more fat. And they gain more fat on the very same diet in which they were having tons of success beforehand. So I think this is where you know my, my I take issue with a lot of the arguments made by Ted Naiman and, and Andreas Einfeld, because I think they're failing to recognize that the experience of these people is equally true as all the other anecdotes that we can point to where people have had success by reducing fat and increasing protein. And I, I was very, very um, clear with them on Twitter multiple times when I said, do you even offer a higher fat version as an option? I'm not saying it has to be your first option, not saying it has to be something you emphasize, but it, is it at least an option? And it is not. They've been very clear with me multiple times. This is not an option for them. This is where they lost me. And this is why I've been so vocal against this, this concept. Because I think it's, although they are marketing it as we're broadening the, the amount of things people can eat, right? That is the argument of SPC. They say low carb works for some people. But we want to do something a bit different where you can have more dietary choices. It's less restrictive, but you can achieve the same results, maybe even better, right? That is what they've said multiple times. But why, how can that be true if you're removing a very basic option uh, that has basically always been an option in the low carb space? We, we used to tell people, experiment. Um, some people would say, no, no, experiment first with more fat. That's really important because fat is really satiating. Other people would say, no, no, you have to try high protein first. That's super satiating. You have to do that. And I'm agnostic about which one is going to work best. I don't think we have the trials to demonstrate this. In fact, I know because I've looked and I've checked and I've asked Ted and Andreas to share trials. And they never share trials. They're actually designed to answer the question that they are supposedly asking. It's trials that are answering something parallel, something similar right? And this is where I think we need to sort of come back to basics and realize we don't have those questions yet. We don't know the effects of protein. We cannot extrapolate, sorry, the effects of protein on a mixed diet to the ketogenic state, which is very different. And we cannot, you know, conflate uh, someone whose intake from protein, half of it is coming from plants versus someone's protein intake is coming from animals. It is not the same quality of protein. It is not the same food with which that protein is coming. So we have lots of unanswered questions that are really, really fascinating. And I think we do people a disservice when we pretend we have more answers than we do. And that is my essentially the problem I have with the, with the approach. It's the claims uh, don't fit the data that we currently have. Well, you hear the title, satiety per calorie, and you could think like, okay, that sounds pretty good. Lots of people in the carnivore world talk about how important satiation is, and satiety is super important. It's different than fullness. It's different than a stomach fullness. So the, the, the title sounds okay. The per calorie part is where it gets a little bit tricky. Can you tell us how this scale even works and what things they're measuring? Yeah, so I don't have a direct access to the full algorithm, but they have described it to me in relatively good detail. So it takes into account uh, multiple factors. So the key factor is that, as you said, it's a tidy per calorie. So if you imagine uh, a fraction, the top part of the fraction is going to be your satiety. And the bottom part of the fraction is going to be calories. Now, uh, if people don't know, um, you have carbs, fat, and protein. Carbs and protein have, let's say, four kilocalories of energy per gram. And fat has nine. So fat is more energy dense. So right away, if you have something that's per calorie, you're going to be penalizing fat. You're going to be penalizing one of the macronutrients. That's a, 
um, that's just you're that's what you're doing definitionally. There's there's no way around that. So you're penalizing fat. So first of all, it's not really an agnostic score as it's being presented because it's penalizing the most energy dense macronutrient. So that's the first thing. Second of all, um, the the factors that go into satiety, what are they? So there's this thing called the hedonic factor, and that is where there's a lot of a work being done, quote unquote, by this hedonic factor, meaning they've looked at studies and studies have tried to measure how um, hedonic a food is. And it's, it's really hard because there's reward, there's palatability, there's the hedonic factor. These are all different words for you know, how much you like something, basically. I know that there will be more particular definitions to them, but they're not very objective, objective definitions. You can really, there's no, it's not like you're, you know, you're defining, uh, I don't know, something like, uh, you know, this is black, this is white. It's, it's not that clear. It's very, very murky. And the way these scores are defined are very circular. You ask people how they rate this food and they will tell you, this is how I rate this food. Of course, if you ask them two weeks after the study's done, they might give you a different score. The studies won't capture that. The studies also won't capture that if they ask you when you come back from a hike and you haven't eaten all day, uh, even the worst tasting food is going to taste pretty good to you if you're hungry, right? So there's these contextual factors, there's these definitional aspects that make the hedonic factor basically a fudge factor. It allows you to mess with the score pretty much as you want. So that's a huge issue when we're trying to uh, quantify something that's really, really hard to quantify. We don't have the means to quantify hedonic factor. Uh, these are very low quality studies. These are not high quality studies. This is the first thing to know. The other factor they have is the amount of fiber. The assumption being that the more fiber food has, it lowers the energy density because fiber is indigestible energy for the most part. And it's also known to stretch your stomach, right? That's why people tend to feel bloated or tend to feel very full when they have a salad or fibrous greens because it activates stretch receptors. And stretch receptors are one of many factors that signal to your brain, hey, food is coming in. Um, we've, had, we've had some energy. You, you can eat a bit less now. It's just one factor. It's not an overriding factor. In fact, there was an approach in the 1990s called volumetrics that was popularized by Barbara Roll. Uh, you can type in volumetrics on Google. You'll see there's lots of diet books from the 90s with the big hairdo and stuff. It was very popular back then. It was a total failure. It never worked, meaning you know, it didn't fix the obesity epidemic. You, you, you can't trick your body into eating less simply because you've stretched it out with fiber. It, it just Our evolution is smarter than that. It's, it's integrating way more signals than this stretch factor. Um, so fiber, unfortunately, is not this trick to get around proper appetite regulation. And then there is the amount of protein in the score, which is uh, an important aspect to satiety. Protein is indeed a, quote, satiating macronutrient, but even this has some limitations. Uh, a lot of what they base uh, the fact that protein is satiating on is something called the protein leverage hypothesis, which has been... Uh, put forth by uh, Simpson and Rabenheimer. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, two researchers uh, who are actually active on Twitter and, and, and engage with, with people. So if you have questions to ask them, they're, they're pretty cool. You can, you can hit them up. And their protein leverage hypothesis uh, posits that very different organisms, not just humans, will keep seeking out food until they've eaten enough protein, basically. That they're guided by protein and until they hit that protein threshold where they're nourished, they're gonna keep keep searching for energy. So if you eat uh, and, uh, protein poor foods, you're gonna eat more calories because you've got to eat more calories until you reach enough, your, your protein goal basically. Um, so this hypothesis does hold true, but only within a range of a percentage energy of the diet. Meaning that if you're eating a very low percentage of protein in your diet, um, increasing the protein will bring more satiation. That's absolutely true. But it operates until approximately 15% of calories. So the average American eats about 18% of calories from protein. So right off the bat, we have a huge problem. We're using a hypothesis 
that only gets up to 15% protein that, that can explain the, the phenomena that we're seeing in a variety of organisms, including humans, that this you have this protein-seeking behavior in a sense. Um, but it's, it stops being uh, useful to explain observations beyond what the average person is actually eating. And that's not recognized by their score. And we've pointed this out to them multiple times. And basically, we get crickets. <laughs> we don't really get an acknowledgement. Uh, oh, no, this is not correct because you've misunderstood. Like, it's, it's basically not really addressed. So that's an, another issue. So we have protein, fiber, hedonic factor. Um, and I think, if I'm not mistaken, there's a combo with salts, maybe. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. There's, there's something else in the, in, the, in the score. But essentially, they're looking at as many factors as they can that produces satiety. And they're dividing that by a calorie amount. And of course, the goal is to have something that makes you makes you feel full, makes you feel satiated without eating too many calories. Now, there's um, a, a big, big assumption uh, within this whole framework that the goal of the score is to make you eat fewer calories. That's why it's a satiety per calorie score. Now, what is that assumption? That assumption is if I get you to eat less, you will lose fat and you will reverse your obesity. Now, I think we've already tried this. There's probably, you know, maybe five decades or more of people saying, okay, how can I eat less? Um, <laughs> what can I do to eat less? Should I be fasting? Should I be, you know, counting my calories? Should I be eating many small meals? There's whole different strategies to eat less. But what we always, always, always keep seeing is that it's not a sustainable strategy. Caloric restriction is a lever for fat loss. I'm not discounting it as a lever. Of course, restricting calories to some extent induces fat loss. It also induces muscle loss, and it is not something that we can do long-term. In fact, we know this from the studies done by Ansel Keys, um, uh, when, th so there was this era, uh, I can't remember exactly which, which year it was, but it was early on in the 20th century, and people who objected to uh, go fight in the war were conscientious objectors. And these people uh, were essentially forced into studies uh, for the army where they were calorically restricted. And we, because at, at the time we didn't know how people reacted exactly. And these people were severely calorically restricted for a lot of time. Uh, we're talking about weeks and months. And I think the cal calorie restriction was pretty severe. I think it was something like 40% of their calories. Uh, don't quote me on that, but it's it something substantial. And the descriptions that you can read in those studies are harrowing. I mean, it's people who go crazy, who become violent, who have these very weird behaviors. You know, they, it, it, you would, you'd think they're in a mental institute, you know, when looking at them. And this told us that, you know, restricting calories, like cr chronic, uh, chronic restriction, forced restriction of calories is not sustainable in any way, shape or form. And we even see this in the infamous uh, Kettner rice diets that was given to obese uh, people and diabetics where they were forced to eat like 90% carb diets. And the only way you could get them to adhere to the diet was by harassing them and whipping them. And people will still uh, inv uh, if, um, talk about these diets as you know evidence of high carb diets being effective for fat loss and diabetes. It's like I don't think you guys have actually read what, what they had to do to get these. It's, they're still very interesting results that on such a high carb diet you can have these weird fat loss and diabetes remission effects, but they're completely unrealistic, unfeasible. And you know I think. I think we've learned so much from the dietary history that we're just forgetting when we're doing, we're inventing these, these food scores like satiety per calorie. And of course, the assumption, like I was saying, is that, okay, if I get you to eat less, you're going to lose fat. But I don't think that's correct. I think when you lose body fat, you automatically eat less because the fat that you're able to liberate is signaling to your brain, hey, we've got energy. Finally, we can access it. We can remove it from adipose tissue and we can burn it. Now we're, we're actually, quote, full. So, so yeah, you don't have to eat more now. So there is a fundamental difference in the causality uh, with regards to fat loss between people like me, Gary Taubes, and many others, and people like Andreas, Ted, uh, Kevin Hall, and, you know, John Speakman and other, other, other researchers. And so there's, like, like you can tell, there's a lot of problems with the satiety per calorie score. 
Um, and yeah, that's that's basically the the overview. Well, you thoroughly debunked a lot of that. That was really well done. Um, you know, you and I have a mutual friend with Dr. Nick Norwitz, and he was showing, this was a few months ago. I don't know if it's still the same. You're right. Like, we don't have access to algorithms or explanations. So they don't really tell us what anything is based on. But he was using the satiety scale to say, like, a meal with, for example, like, olive oil and Oreos would score, like, this perfect combination, which the perfect combination between one and hundred is you're supposed to score a 50, which is somewhere in the middle. And so it just gets to be very confusing. And it's tough because there was an episode of Peak Human a few weeks ago that talked about this. You mentioned Brian already, Brian Sanders. You mentioned Ted Naiman. We love both those guys. They've been on my show as well. We've talked to them. Um, and Nick Norwitz was there and they were all debating. And Nick was asking a lot of the same questions that you were asking and, and was asking, why are we saying that this is science? When this is not based on science, it's way too subjective and new, and it doesn't make sense for people. And Nick did such a great job asking the question that that is exactly the way I feel about this. Do you, do you think that changing what you're doing as diet doctor is going to make people like myself less likely to recommend my clients go to diet doctor? I feel m less confident that people are going to get good information that will get them to health than I w was when I was doing those weight loss contests that were so wildly successful. And that's how I feel. And that's why I end up canceling my diet doctor membership. And I don't recommend it because I don't know what information people are going to get. And it's it's a real shame because, like I said, I, I love diet doctor. They were such an influence in my career. And I know they were for you as well and, and all the learning that we've had. So it, it's unfortunate that this is being promoted as the latest and greatest science, yet there's so many holes in it. Yeah, it's it's a real pity. Um, you know, I think a lot of people were were disappointed by the move. And it's it's not because we don't want people to innovate. It's not because we we want people to stay low carb. It, we want people to be healthy. And we each have opinions on, on how people should attempt that. And that's fine. But it feels like um, the, the, the premise, the, the idea behind why, why they wanted to do this new score, I don't feel like it's, it's coming from um, maybe not the most sincere place, but it doesn't feel like they're, they're giving, they're, they're not expressing the limitations of their approach. So I've said to them multiple times, why don't you use this as a heuristic? A heuristic is like a loose rule, which is useful, but you know that it's not perfect and it's not going to apply all the time. If you want to help people pay attention to their hunger cues, which is one different way of, it's another word for satiety, um, that's great. I mean, Dr. Tro, who I'm friends with, does that all the time with his patient. He talks about behavior change. He talks about why does this make you feel the way it makes you feel, uh, pay attention to your triggers. Um, are you sure uh, this is that you're, you're eating it because you're hungry or are you eating it because you have cravings? I think that's great. That's really, really helpful. But I, I don't want people to think that everything is about satiety because it's not. We also have, for example, we have lots of, of measures where we, we see that satiety isn't even well correlated to food intake, which is kind of surprising, right? You would expect that when people report feeling satiated, that this would like perfectly correlate with their energy intake. It just doesn't. And yes, that's very counterintuitive and sort of tricky. And like, what do we do with this concept of satiety? But that's just the empirical data we have. We have lots of experiments, whether it's with drugs that induce, um, quote, satiety hormones like GLP-1. We can see GLP-1 go up in the blood and satiety is not a result. We do not see the behavior that we expect from it. So it's, it's a limited concept. And I think it's totally fine. If, if you like that word, you like that concept, you want people to pay attention to their choices. You think they're snacking on, on too much heavy cream or macadamia nuts. Okay, great. Give them that option. Tell them that they should you know, pay attention to their hunger. But tr transforming it into a supposedly objective score, which, is it, which it isn't, and saying it is based on RCTs, which it is not, there is no satiety per calorie RCT. There is no uh, study that I was sent that controls for the things that would need to be controlled for in order to make those claims. I think you're, you're first of all, most likely to be wrong um, in, that, in that instance, but also you're doing a disservice to the people who are coming for you for clarity. The diet industry is a murky, uh, terrible place. <laughs> it's full of scams. It's full of, you know, 
uh, superficial influencers. It, it's a real problem. So one of the things that I think you, meant, you already mentioned is that Diet Doctor was clear. It was transparent. It was simple. Uh, it didn't overpromise. Um, you know, it was sort. Of, it had this sort of neutrality with it that attracted so many people because they feel, oh, this isn't just another diet camp. It's not another ideology. This is just describing a method, and it seems to work for a lot of people. And I think that's why it was so successful. And I don't think that their satiety per calorie project, which is now uh, branched out into this uh, new venture called Hava, H-A-V-A, I don't think it can have the same success because it's missing out on the simplicity uh, of what made Diet Doctor so so magic before. Um, yeah, it's it's a pity. Yeah, it's too bad. That's such a good point too, is like, if I, if I want to learn... If I want to learn about my bicycle, for example, I'm going to go to the Yeti website and look up the suspension on the Yeti model that I have. I'm not saying that the specialized stump jumper suspension system is any worse. It could be way better. I don't know. I just, I want to learn about my one thing and I know where to go to find it. It's like, we're not saying that you can't use other methods and other ways don't work. If you want Mediterranean diet, type in Mediterranean diet. Diet doctor was low carb. It was the space that you went for low carb and them trying to do, I don't know, what, what just seems like, too many different ways and too many different things. I mm-hmm. think is confusing. I hope I hope you're right. I hope they clean things up over time. I have my doubts, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, it's very interesting. I really appreciate your opinions and your clarity on that. I feel like we just scratched the surface on that. We could go a lot deeper, but I do want to ask you about the baby formula you're developing. This is oh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Can you tell us about this? Yeah. So this came about last year where someone hired me to design a baby formula. And I was, I was I was always very interested in infant nutrition, um, just because I think when you're trying to understand nutrition, you need to understand it from as many angles as possible. Because if you think drug development is complicated, well, try to figure out nutrition. I mean, drugs have one or two compounds in them. Nutrition has you know millions, literally, of of compounds. So we're talking a level of complexity where you just you're dealing with a complex system. Um, and I'm using the word complex system in the technical sense, meaning that you can't make simple predictions. You have to build in uh, probability and uncertainty into everything you do. It's not a simple engineering issue. It's much more complicated. So I think you have to look at it from the evolutionary angle, as I mentioned. You have to look at it from the clinical medical angle, meaning what are doctors saying? What are patients saying? Look at case reports, listen to anecdotes. And then you have to look at the big trials, uh, which are really well controlled, uh, randomized, all that. And you have to look at the associational data to come up with hypotheses, to try to falsify some other observations. Well, that's great. And one aspect was also look at nutrition throughout the life cycle. So what applies to a 90-year-old won't apply to a 40-year-old, right? People who are 90 need way more protein. They just don't uh, absorb it as efficiently as young people. And infants or even pre, prenatal, so you know, um, in utero, um, they have very special needs. Um, they're in a developmental phase that is gonna impact the rest of their life. And nutrition might be the most sensitive factor uh, that affects them, arguably. And so I was always very interested in this. And when this opportunity came up to design a baby formula, this was very exciting because it's also a super high leverage point for affecting health. Right? If you can affect the health of an infant, um, you're most likely going to, those benefits are going to extend all the way through their, their life. So it was a huge opportunity for me and a very interesting opportunity for me to dive really deep into the literature around baby formula, but also breast milk, because I had no uh, claims to know exactly how formula should be made, but I knew that uh, formula was not reflecting breast milk and that breast milk was, you know, light years better than, than formula. So all I told myself is, okay, I'm going to learn about breast milk and I'm going to try to make a formula that's as close to breast milk as, as is possible, basically. So I spent many, many months just reading, reading, reading everything I could about, about breast, uh, breast milk and formula and also all of the legal aspects around that because it's a real mess. It's very hard to, to get the baby formula you want on the market. It's really, really difficult. But basically, the big issues we have with uh, infant formula um, is that they are first very high in omega-6 linoleic acid, which is the principal fatty acid in most of the industrial oils that are used everywhere in the world. So every fried food, every uh, chocolate bar, 
every pretty much everything has seed oils in it, whether it's sunflower oil, corn oil, soybean oil, canola oil, you name it, it's it's everywhere. It's probably the biggest dietary change in the past 100, 200 years is this oil. Um, and so baby formula is full of it. And it's it's a tragedy because it's a very fragile oil. And this oil, when you actually take random samples of the supermarket shelves and you put it um, through GCMS, um, which is a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer, which is this thing that can that like um, evaporates gas and, and measures the different um, um, measures the properties of those gases and tells you, okay, I can identify this gas by how it behaves in this machine, how it's flowing through it, how 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 much it weighs, and different stuff. And when you do that, you see that actually these oils are converting or oxidizing to many different compounds. And these compounds are highly toxic. They're not only toxic, they're also carcinogenic. So you've got something called glycidyl esters and uh, 3-MCPD, I think is the other one. Um, these are two so-called carcinogenic compounds. And I say so-called because they're also arthrogenic. Um, and they're, at least according to the European safety limits that are set by these um, governmental institutions, most baby formula contains more carcinogens than are allowed according to the European safety standards. And this is everywhere. This is not, you know, one random formula. This is like the average formula that you can go by. You will be feeding something that has is, is considered dangerously carcinogenic and atherogenic. And it's a tragedy because it's totally avoidable. There's no reason that you must have that much linoleic acid in formula. There is no scientific health, nothing. This is purely an economic decision. And it's a tragedy. So the first thing I did when designing this oil is say, I'm going to get the linoleic acid levels as, as far down as I can. And of course, you could technically get it to zero. There is no physiological reason for an infant to require a certain amount of linoleic acid as long as they have the other omega-6, which is arachidonic acid. This arachidonic acid is only found in animal foods. So it's not an infant formula. There is no requirement by the FDA to have one. Actually, there's no requirement by the FDA to have the two essential fatty acids, which are DHA, which you can only find in fish and other animals, and arachidonic acid, which you can only find in fish and other animals. ALA, which is the plant version of omega-3, alpha linoleic acid, and linoleic acid, uh, which is an omega-6 that that's found both in plants and animals, those are considered essential by the FDA and many other governments uh, around the world. So first of all, they're wrong about that. Those aren't the essential fatty acids. They are precursors to the essential fatty acids. So they're conditionally essential, meaning if the actual fatty acids aren't available, then they become essential. But you need the essential fatty acids in such small amounts. I mean, they're literally less than one, you know, less than two percent, less than one percent of of what you need in the diet. That if you eat any amount of animal foods, you 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 can't basically be deficient in those essential fatty acids. So you do not need linoleic acid. You do not need alpha linoleic acid. You need DHA and arachidonic acid, and the FDA has no requirement for the two essential ones. So, which is scandalous. Um, I don't know how that can be a thing, and people aren't up in arms. So, I wanted to lower the linoleic, linoleic acid, and I wanted to put in some DHA and some arachidonic acid. So that's a big part of what why the formula uh, is going to be much better than what's on the market. But there's much, much more. There's the type of lipids. So, for example, in infant formula. If you look at the, um, if you put the fat under a microscope and you look at it, it's about, I think, 0.3 micrometers in diameter, like these little, little globules of fat. But actually, the real fat from breast milk is about 10 times as big. It's about three something uh, micrometers in diameter. So those are called milk fat globule membranes, MFGM. And you don't have that in standard formula. It, it does exist. There are some specialty formulas which use these kind of, of fat uh, globules, but they're very, very rare. You, I mean, they're a tiny, tiny fraction of the market. Basically, no one, no one knows about it. Um, so that's one thing that that I want to have in the in the baby formula. Then there's also the kind of fat, meaning 
most of the fat um, that's in uh, infant formula comes from palm oil. Um, so you have stuff from sunflower oil, but also palm oil. And palm oil is high in palmitic acid. Palmitic acid is named after palm oil. It's a saturated fat. And breast milk naturally has tons of saturated fat and half of the calories in milk are fat anyways, right? So nature trying to give us an early heart attack again, wouldn't you know? Um, but the palmitic acid from palm oil is different than the palmitic acid from a mammal. So it's, it's, it has the same name, but it's not exactly the same molecule. So palmitic acid is basically, if you imagine like um, uh, a comb for your hair, which has like this, this bar and then these spikes coming down from it, that's kind of what a triglyceride molecule looks like. You have these three um, fats coming down off of this glycerol backbone, at its, as it's called. And you have position one, two, and three. So the palm oil, the palmitic acid, is it has a low amount of um, a certain fatty acid in the second position in the second position. The palmitic acid from animals, from mammals, from you know um, your mother, uh, a cow, whatever, it's different. It has a high degree of what's called SN2 esterification, meaning the, the fatty acid is, is highly represented in the second position. And this is a, actually a huge difference. It means you can absorb nutrients better. You can absorb fat better. You'll have less colics. You'll have less diarrhea. You know, you'll have a whole host of benefits just from this small chemical change in, on, on the palmitic acid. And once again, this is an economic decision. There is no health reason to have palmitic acid from palm oil rather than having it from you know, a, a mammalian source. So that's another thing I would like to put in it. Um, let's see what else. Um, there's so we mentioned DHA, we mentioned arachidonic acid, we mentioned milk fat globule membrane, um, and then there's also uh, let's see what else. And then there's the whole micronutrient array. So a lot of the micronutrients we have are in the quote plant form or synthetic form, which are very cheap, very easily available, but they're not the optimal form. So for example, we'll have vitamin K1 in infant formula, but we won't have vitamin K2, which is actually the active form that we would get from, you know, again, once again, eggs and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different nutrients. I mean, there's vitamin B6, there's, um, um, let's see, there's also vitamin D, of course, vitamin D3, you want, you know, you want to have enough of that in it. So there's a whole host of things that you can do to improve formula that is simply mimicking breast milk. You don't have to come up with a Nobel laureate, a winning idea that's novel. You just have to imitate breast milk. And that's basically what I'm trying to do as, as best I can. That's amazing, dude. Man, okay, so I've got so many questions. Unfortunately, we're out of time. I'm going to put you on the spot and ask if there's another time we could bring you back to maybe deep dive into baby formula. Because sure. like I said, I've got I would so many to questions this is if i if i could like think of a thing that rafael sertoli would be really really good at like you would you would just invent this thing like this is perfect for you dude this is like your wheelhouse i'm so excited to see yeah. how that develops and baby formulas are atrocious it's such a crazy yeah. industry and it's so bad and to see you out there helping people is just fabulous this has been an awesome conversation again i love catching up with you where would you like people to go to find you and connect with you and your work uh, thank you, Casey. Uh, it's always a pleasure speaking with you. I'm, I would love to come back and talk about the baby formula. Hopefully, I'll, we'll have made some progress and I'll have some samples to show you guys on, on camera next time we, we talk. Amazing. Um, that would be amazing. Yeah. No, no I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so basically, so you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Raphael S7 with PH. So R-A-P-H-A-E-L-S-7 can find me there on Twitter. Um, you can also go to the website of my medical clinic, which is in Lisbon, Portugal, and that's uh, P-E-R-O.pt, pero.pt. And then you can also go to zeroacre.com, which is the website selling low linoleic acid cooking oil. So this is a neutral tasting, uh, high oleic, low omega-6 oil that's made from bacteria that ferment sugar cane. Uh, which is a really cool uh, project because it's both sustainable, healthy, 
you know, and um, of course, uh, I would argue ethical because it's much less destructive than the oils that are based from monocrops. So zeroacre.com. Um, if you go to the white paper section, you can see what we've uh, we've done deep dives on atherosclerosis, heart disease, uh, obesity, and we'll soon have some new articles coming out on cancer and a whole host of other things uh, that I'm writing about there. So yeah, those two websites and uh, my Twitter. That's amazing. We will link to all of that in the show notes. Like we said in the introduction, no surprise that you're very, very busy <laughs> these days. <laughs> Rob Garrison, totally. Thank you so very much for taking time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you, Casey. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.